Kelly, you're taking the notes for this meeting. Thank you for volunteering to do that. We will start with public comment, up to three minutes per speaker and 15 minutes allowed. Hello. Hi. My name is Susan Fountain. Um, I'd like to read excerpts from the November 9th Board of Health meeting that was posted on YouTube for the world to see. These are not my comments. I've made a copy for those in the audience as well as for your committee. Um, and I'll just read what was on YouTube. We have nothing else to do. This is at the Board of Health meeting. People come in here. Why climate change isn't happening kind of the no-sayers. This whole group of people that sit in that room and just try to disrupt the need so nothing can happen. And then the Board of Health, someone says, we've met many of them. Another statement, nobody else has this list and the town is effed. <gasps> so I'm going to pass this out and I have comments about this. Um, the tone that was used was sarcastic, mocking, and unprofessional. This is an abuse of position and power, disparaging those that disagree. If it's not a violation, it should be. I've been coming to these meetings for over a year, and disrupting a meeting couldn't be further from the truth. This is a serious and false accusation. Citizens have expressed their views and followed your directives. It is a former member of this committee who yelled at citizens and created a confrontational atmosphere. That person being so Susan well Moser. I asked, don't you want different thoughts to make better decisions? If you ask us to jump off a bridge, do you expect us to follow and not ask why? If you intend to control and dictate what people in town can and cannot do, you have to allow for public input. This is a democracy. I ho had hoped and was confident that everyone would follow the code of conduct and learn from Susie Moser's use of profanity, become unhinged during the August meeting. Um, I'd like Jane to explain her comments, and I'm gonna yeah. hand out copies to all of you because this again this was on this. YouTube <clears throat> for the world to see. But this was during a Board of Health meeting? Yes, oh, November 9th. Okay, so there she is. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Other other public comments? You have three minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I just uh, I won't take much time. I just want to uh, affirm what uh, Sue Mucci said that she, I think she's absolutely right. The, the reason why it, it matters to the climate change is because it was because, uh, Ms. Stephen Smith is a, is a liaison and she was coming to this meeting. And just it, it's important that we that we get this straightened out because a, a couple of points is that I've, I've, I've been coming to these meetings for some time. I've never heard anyone say that climate change isn't happening. It's just not true. And no one, and that, that's a ridiculous statement. Say, yeah, we live in a a valley that was formed by a glacier. So climate change is happening, but, and there are differences about what to do about that and, and what the causes are. But so the uh, the question is whether Ms. Stephens Smith can continue as a liaison when she's wow. misrepresenting <laughs> facts. Uh, the other point that's important is, is that Sue mentioned further, is that um, it's a point about disrupting. Uh, no one in, in my experience has tried to disrupt the meeting. That's that's a serious <laughs> accusation because um, you know we we all try to speak when we're given, given the opportunity. Sometimes sometimes people get emotional, sometimes not. But no one's tried to disrupt or stop the meeting. That's really an egregious accusation, and I think that needs to be addressed. And I, I understand that it was <coughs> said in the other room a few feet from here. But it, uh, Ms. Devin Smith is, is the liaison. And for this board to have credibility, that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Okay, can you just give me yep. two seconds? Other people for public comment? <laughs> I've only been to one meeting. The meeting I went to was, was I don't like when somebody says that we're not going to be able to have a campfire anymore. That's too extreme for me. You know what I'm saying? We all want to work together. That's not a problem, but. 
these wildfires are wrecking the climate, like worse over the last 20 years of ours trying to stop it, the wildfires are wiping it out. I mean, I want a campfire. I'm fighting for a campfire. <laughs> That's about it. You know, I can see we get, we got to do all everything. Hybrid is the way to go. I'm in the business of cars. You know that. Why is nobody talking about hybrid? Everybody gets a little bit. Hybrid Toyota Highlander is really nice. Are right, getting 42 miles per gallon? I think you guys can live with that. And smaller cars can even get better. I'm in the automotive business. A hybrid is what I believe. My opinion. And that's working together. Not my way or the highway. That's what a lot of people really don't like. No plans intended. <laughs> that's it. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead. <clears throat> I believe in practicing what you preach. Um, I don't know what this, I know everybody has their own feelings like everybody was saying, but unless you actually, like Steve was saying, have an EV car, have some solar on your house or wherever you have it, and have dismantled all of your fossil fuels and gotten rid of it and gotten heat pumps, it's kind of tough to be telling us what to do when you are still using all of those same things. <laughs> Thank you. Jeff Moynerity. Uh, to add to that, I'm a plumber. I do heating work, plumbing work, the whole nine yards. I don't mind having a heat pump water heater. I don't mind putting solar on my roof. I've got solar on my roof. I've got a heat pump water heater in my house, but don't force me to put those into my house. Oh, you guys. In Go ahead, Jack. Oh, I just want to, you know, uh, point out that the committee is really focused on the municipality and uh, helping the town be a green community. So it's not so much uh, for forcing anyone to do anything, but having the town agree to, you know, put solar up and, uh, for the town's energy use, such as solar to power the school, maybe to save some money stuff like that, and less to force people to buy electric cars or uh, force people to put solar on their house, you know, well, I'm sure people in the committee would encourage that. The purpose of this is not to force citizens to do anything, rather help the municipality, the town of Hadley, and the government buildings, uh, you know, run more efficiently and on more clean energy for a better cost. Um, so just want to point that out and you know and also I really agree with people that you know civil liberties are important and everybody should be heard and yeah. so that's the go ahead uh, are there rules that I don't know anything about because I didn't know about people forcing anybody to do anything that's what I'm confused about in public comment, we can't respond oh, in an open yeah. meeting. I, I don't think so. Well, uh, to your comment to that, things were mentioned of uh, first going to the fossil fuels and the thoughts of going to those stoves. And that's why it was mentioned about having campfires. So burning wood would be the next thing. So that's our also concern as to when is it going to stop. Yeah, I, I think everybody should be encouraged to voice their opinions. You know, like catalytic converters, we were forced to put those in our cars. And so there have been things, but, um, you know, I want to have a campfire, too. <laughs> I got one more. Oh, hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Is everybody, anybody else, yeah. before you go again, right. is there anybody okay. else? Go ahead. Uh, Ford's cut back 50% of their electric Ford F-150s. They're not filling half of what they said they were going to. There's a reason for it. I don't know who knows what it is, but there's probably a really good reason why instead of going forward, they're cutting them out. Please. Yeah, I, um, I know you I'm sorry, could you say your name? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Um, Brenda Fettenkevitz. <clears throat> Excuse me, from uh, Rocky Hill Road. And <clears throat> I think that you know, we all want to leave this place better than when we, we, what we found.
around. I'm, you know, I like to do my own thing. I have solar panels on my roof. I think it's a good thing for what I want. But I think that this climate change has gone way too far. Um, I think we have to be reasonable about it. People aren't even thinking about what's going on in some of these, the, with the wildfires and these forests, like in California, up in the, the Northwest, things like that. We also have to think about forest management. And if we had proper forest management, we wouldn't have half of these fires that we're having. This is the first time I've seen in my lifetime, maybe I've been under a rock somewhere, that I've seen heavy smog coming down here from Canada because of the wildfires. I think that, you know, we, we do have to be level-headed. I think that, you know, this is, I've heard, I've heard arguments on both sides. I've heard, you know, some really good scientists that say, hey, this, this, this is, you know, climate change is real. And I've heard some really good scientists say, and a lot of them say that this is, this is not the whole truth. So I don't think, and it's not gonna happen in this town, that this stuff is going to be, you know, pushed on us. It seems like this is the whole thing, climate change, climate change, climate change. Yes, let's do a good job to help the environment. But I think that it's gotta be done reasonably. Anybody else? All right. Thank you all for your comments. We have a guest who is able to join us today to talk about the farm conversation. We're hoping to pull together um, an event for the farmers, and we may do it in conjunction with CISA. Margaret, would you please share your story and what we can do to pull this together? Yeah, really, I'm here. I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're thinking about because I'm here, you know, because I understood that I know Jack that you talked to my colleague Stephen Toronto, who does climate work at CISA, and um, said that you were thinking about doing a farmer conversation. And we worked with Wally in the early fall to pull together an opportunity to farmers for farmers to talk to each other about the weather disasters. This. Through, through the course of 2023 and what kind of relief was possible and what additional help could be useful to farmers. And we're interested in having a follow-up conversation. So it seemed like there might be some overlap between what you all are thinking and what we're thinking. And you know we'd be happy to work with you on that. Um, but I'd be interested in knowing a little bit more about what you're planning as well. So certainly opening, opening it up to every member of the committee on what the visions could be for a February or March gathering of farmers to discuss how they respond to what's been going on. I think that's what we had in mind was at how are farmers thinking about adapting to these changes. Maybe they can help each other by talking, sharing ideas. Yeah, one of the reasons you were invited is because this committee doesn't want to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. Well, we are definitely fostering opportunities for farmers to hear from each other. We have some opportunities to help people implement new practices or to you know get some planning help if they're trying to figure out, does, would this work on my farm, would it not work on my farm, are there other people that have done it, have people done it here in the Northeast, or is it something that they do someplace else? Have they done it at a scale that's appropriate for my farm, or is this something right. that's been, you know, tested on farms that don't really look like a lot like my farm? So it, I think it is really helpful to, for farmers to hear from each other about that kind of stuff, and we have had, you know, good response to the activities that we've done along those lines. So is this a um, series of meetings that you're having, or what's so, the setup? Um, we do a whole variety of things. We The last couple of years in September, we've done a, a whole week of activities in partnership with other organizations focused on climate change and farming. And those have looked a lot of different ways. Some are for, you know, really focused on farmers. Some are focused more on the general public. Um, and we will be doing that again next September. We are planning um, a series of workshops. This is a little bit tentative. It's not finalized yet. but. 
we are thinking particularly about heat and increased heat and how that affects you know, plants and animals and soil and people. And um, so we're thinking about a series of workshops on that topic. But specifically in terms of a kind of a networking, like a time for farmers to talk to each other, our, the, the, the direction that we are headed this winter is really thinking about policy change, particularly at the state level. Federal policy is um, you know, further removed from us and a little bit harder to have an impact on, but our state legislative delegation and the um, State Department of Agricultural Resources are very responsive and really interested in how to help farmers as they demonstrated um, this summer in terms of the relief that they made available to farms that had been impacted by the climate and weather related disasters this year. Um, so I think there is policy po possibilities for <coughs> impacting state level policy, but I think um, those of us who are, don't aren't policy makers, like who don't think all the time about what can government do, it's sort of a big topic. And if you get a lot of people in the room and you say, what kind of policy change would you want? I think it's a little hard for people to make that up out of whole cloth if that's not their business, just the way mm -hmm. If you got somebody who doesn't know how to farm and said, you know, grow this winter squash, they wouldn't really know how to do it. Um, so our thinking for the meeting that we have been thinking about has been around thinking about what other policy, what other states and what other places are doing around climate related policy that might be useful to farmers. So it might be looking at things that help farmers, for example, learn about new practices they could implement. Could be thinking about different ways to do crop insurance because the federal crop insurance isn't really a very good fit for a lot of farms in our region. So is there something we could do at the state level? Um, could be thinking about relief efforts like the kind of relief that the state came through with this summer, but that's not codified, you know, it's not necessarily going to be there the next time, so it could be thinking about how do you do that going forward. So I don't know what all the options are, but our thought has been um, to do some research, to find out some ideas so that people have something to chew on. So we wouldn't necessarily bring, be bringing those ideas as like, here's the, the platform, here's what we want. It would be, here's a bunch of ideas, what do you think? And, and mm -hmm. have people say, that would never work here because mm -hmm. X, Y, Z, like we are different than that state where they want to do that. We would want to do it differently, but if you changed it this way or that way, we think it might really work. So it just gives people a starting point to sort of say, yeah, we think this would be important. So that's a little bit different than the meeting that it sounds like you're imagining that's a little bit focused more on what, do you, what can you do, you know, on your own farm in your own field. But we would be happy to help you all think about how to do that kind of meeting. And, you know, we might be able to, to help with that or come participate or um, that kind of thing. And, and we could do our policy thing and you could help farmers and Hadley know about it and they could come if they wanted. Um, Okay. Yeah. Michael, Marion, you've all done a lot of farming over the years. What are your thoughts on how to pull this together? Because, um, you know, with CESA, I'm thinking one target audience is usually the smaller farms, but we also don't want to exclude some of the bigger, bigger farms and get their opinions, too. Right. Yeah, I, I think it, it all sounds like a good idea. Um, you know, farmers like to hear from other farmers because we tend not to trust anybody else <laughs> in terms of telling us, giving us information. And so um, it would be helpful to kind of share our, you know, our strategies for minimizing our risks. Um, but by the same token, I think farmers would be very interested in what the policy options are. And um, so I, you know, I don't know how we meld those two things, but those both seem like the right direction to be heading. Right, and I also just think, like, I mean, Wally, you've done some gather gatherings with other farmers, but for for us to have an addition, you know, to continue this work and this conversation, just feels like a really important piece. And especially since we're an agricultural yeah. town, yeah. we've mm -hmm. obviously been impacted by weather. So Patrick, Ber Patrick Berezo, who's the library director, he and I met and 
there's some openings. The library, I don't know if you've been inside. It has a big front, it has a big front room and they could host mm -hmm. this kind of event. Again, it's figuring out what event is gonna have value for local farmers and who would be able to come. Is there any continuation from the event you had at Wally's farm, at Plainville farm? I mean, this, this um, thing we're thinking about related to policy has sort of been our thought about next, a next step as far as getting people together. Um, the immediate next step after that event, that, that event happened right after the state relief funding was announced, and so we wanted to make sure people knew about that, and then we wanted to help people apply. You had to estimate your losses, and some people you know, find that easy, and some people find it hard, and so we wanted people to know where they could get help. So we did a, you know, a fair amount of that during the fall, but those um, you know, people have been getting those checks in the last couple of weeks, so um, that, that piece is kind of Was that the grant that helped like 56 area farms? Or was that I a different grant? I think it's more than that. that. I think that was a $20 million fund that the um, legislature put together very shortly after the flooding and the governor signed. They had a really remarkably quick turnaround. And I think they this is funded 347 farms. Okay, um, wow. And they, they had $20 million. And I think the loss of people, the losses that were estimated in the applications were, don't quote me, maybe in the $60 million. I think it was said 65 million. Than, than yeah. what they could fund. Nonetheless, they, they also made a, you know, a very great effort. So again, we're hoping to have a speaker series on a few different conversations and making sure that the farmers are heard is a big part of it. I don't know if we want to focus on the policy issue, right. but it's more just get them together at a time where they're not pressed and stressed by spring planting. And then they have an opportunity to talk. Yeah, well, we could certainly, I mean, one possibility is that our primary climate change staffer, Stephen Toronto, who's out of the country right now, so otherwise he would be here, but he could be a speaker at that event. And, and I understand that you're not, you're primarily wanting farmers to talk to each other, so you don't want to have lots of people standing up in the front of the room talking. But he could talk a little bit about the assistance that we can make available, some of the other ways to tap into assistance. Um, there is grant money that can help farmers implement some of these practices. So he could you know, give a little bit of background on that. And then maybe together it would be possible to think about how to facilitate, like whether you just then just say, like, here's some food, eat and talk, or whether you want more <coughs> organized. Um, conversation and maybe you all could give some thought to what you think would work for farmers in Hadley and <coughs> what we could help. Um, you know, Stephen could be there to provide some information and I, I think we would definitely be interested in being listeners as well because yeah. we're really interested in How do you pronounce Stephen's last name? Toronto. Okay. Like, like city. But it, and and what is his title? He's the coordinator of our climate change. But it's T A. It's T A. It's like it's like the city of Toronto, only all the O's are A's. Okay. <laughs> so again, we're looking to do this into February, early March. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if it, I don't know whether, you know, I should make sure Jack that he's in touch with you again when he's back next week, or whether there's a, a subcommittee of you all who want to be thinking about this. Or you yeah, it's Jack. Yeah. Jack's the subcommittee of this. Yeah. this There's only this is like that, seven of us all together. Me. Do you know when he's coming back next week? I think he's. I think he's back all week. I can't. Okay. I can't. I'm not entirely sure if he's here on Monday, but he's back most of the week. So how would we get in touch with him? <coughs> he, he I'll just. I'll Jack call. Have, okay. Yeah, okay. Have We've already talked. Corresponded. Yep. But I can help him. So on this topic, I was wondering, have you heard from Ellen Drews or have you gotten in touch with her at Astarte? Remember, she was at our last meeting yep. and was willing to get in touch with other farmers to see if they wanted to come together with us. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. So did you get in touch with her? Well, easy enough to get in touch with her. Okay. I can contact her after I talk with Steve next week. Or okay. Steven next I think week. I sent you her email. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.
Thank you. Appreciate you coming out. Yeah. No I have a feeling it's been a long week for you. I've had a long week. Mm -hmm. It's been a long week. 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 It's been a long November yeah, minutes. The motion, November session. Motion to approve the November minutes. I second. All right, and mm -hmm. time to vote. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Wait, oh, yeah, you're abstaining. And you're abstaining. Five. Okay. Five yeses. And that brings us <laughs> to you, Michael, <laughs> and solar on the town landfill and possibly <laughs> the senior center, but I know you're really focused more on landfill for now. Yeah. Um, sorry. There we go. So um, I was tasked with doing some research on the financial feasibility of doing a solar field on the town landfill and um, and there's also been some some discussion about putting solar on the library on the senior center and I'm not going to talk about that tonight there's um, there's also the possibility of putting some solar on on a, a, a bigger spot than these two buildings, the the um, the, the uh, high school, and I haven't had a chance to look at that. But I do have some fairly interesting numbers on on the landfill. David Phil worked with um, the town administrator many a number of years ago and looked at this. And um, I I don't know what the result was, but the regulations and the incentives have changed dramatically since then. So what may or may not have made sense then makes a lot of sense right now. It looks yeah. like, the, the, based on these numbers, and I'm gonna go through them with you, and I, I welcome input and suggestions because they are rough numbers at this time, but based on our preliminary analysis, it could earn the town about $3 million over the course of, of a 25-year uh, landfill operation. And those are very conservative numbers, and they don't include some other sources of income that I was not able to quantify yet, and they don't include uh, possible grant money that we might be able to secure for some of the installations. Okay. So, um, can everybody hear me? Okay. When you're okay. talking to us. I just missed that uh, one last sentence yeah. you just said. Can everybody so, hear me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Three million dollars over how many years? Over twenty-five. Twenty-five. So that's years. revenue we would. That's receive? that is saved electric costs. Okay basically off of our electric bill. Right. The town has a usage of about 1.5 megawatt in annual consumption. That, wow. That's quite a bit of electricity. It's schools. And it's the schools, it's also the uh, sewage plants and the pumps yeah. and moving wa fresh water around. Yeah. It's everything. And, um, and so I got hold of all of those numbers and added them up and that's how we got to the to the 1.6 or 1.7 megawatt need that the town has for electricity each year. That's what we're currently buying. Um, so I'm going to turn in a minute to what the costs of installation are. Um, actually, I'll just do that right now. Let's see here if I can figure out what we got here. Um, this started out as a, a back of the envelope feasibility yeah, analysis. Yeah. We kept the name, but I think we can say it's a back of a napkin at this point. <laughs> it's, it's getting better. Um, and so what we're looking at is a 1.5 megawatt system with batteries because once a system gets over half of a megawatt, in order to take advantage of the state's smart mm -hmm. solar program incentives, they require you to have batteries in there. And that's because we're bringing such a large load onto the grid that you want to be able to protect the grid 
you want we want to be able to improve the grid so that we when the grid doesn't need the electricity we can put it into batteries and right. when it's nighttime or when the wind's not blowing off offshore we can use the batteries to to feed into the grid yes so how do the batteries link into the town system or into the grid everything links into the grid at site so the, the batteries are there the panels are there and the panels presumably would be on top of the of, of the landfill um, it, putting the panels on top of a landfill are are about a buck a, wa a watt more expensive between 75 cents and a buck 25 let me back up putting panels on a landfill because you can't puncture the landfill you have to use a ballast system is going to cost between a buck 75 and 220 250 per watt and that's as compared to a land mounted uh, system which is about a buck 50. so it is a little bit more expensive but there are incentives for that, that the state requires the utility pay us for the electricity that we produce that make up for that added cost and that's kind of part of what I want to show. Aren't there also the incentives for for using areas like landfills to Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. Okay. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. So you're saying there's an incentive oh. Oh. from the yep. state to put a system on a landfill versus say Excuse me. Section on this field. This is not. No, like I, I, I would. I would like to have questions. Okay, okay. I, I really would because right. I think it's helpful to. Okay. I might learn something and yeah, somebody. I get that, but I'm yeah. saying. The as long as the questions, as long as the cost. questions deal. Let me just quick clarify. As long as the questions you're right. dealing with, no, what it we're is helpful. About, I'm very open to it. So yes. So the state is offsetting the cost of the ballast system versus okay. somebody it's not actually the state coming up with the money it's it's the state requiring that the utility pay us an extra portion of a penny so the, per watt the extra cost of it going on the landfills being offset by somebody is not costing us extra to put it on the land a a versus somebody putting it on an open field exactly right. and that's because a few years ago people started ramming these big solar fields up on prime farmland. They started mm -hmm. cutting down forests to, 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 to put panels up. And so the state took a step back and said, okay, we need to incentivize this so that it goes toward places that we want it to. Let's put them on the landfills. There aren't that many landfills that don't have them yet right now. Let's put them on industrial sites that are already m messed up. Let's, let's put them on the roof of carports. So there's all these different, what they call adders which requires the utility to pay a few extra pennies for those watts, basically, that you're producing in these incentivized places. Did I make, did that make no, sense? No, that makes sense. Okay, thank great. You. All right, thank you. It was a good question. Um, so um, basically, these are the costs of the project. Um, uh, there's, I'm sorry, these are the description of the project, a, a uh, 1.5 megawatt, um, and, the insulation cost for that at two bucks per watt is three million dollars. The battery install cost is five, and this is the number that I don't really, I can't know for sure, so we put in a great big number in here to protect us. Mm -hmm. um, and to run three-phase electricity from Route 9 and West Street, which it, it will cost about six hundred thousand dollars per mile, that's about a point seven mile um, connection there and so we put a little extra here too just to just to be conservative yes so th is this um, what was that guy's name that came last time that gave us all that information he said it was a long like a long distance it's 0. 0.7 miles so, so that's not so far actually it where costs about six hundred thousand dollars per mile where is that location where we were hooking uh, route 9 has three phase if, if if you look at a telephone pole and you look at the wires, if you three, see three wires on top, it means it's three phase. If oh, okay. you see one wire on top, it's one wire. Okay. So three phase goes all the way down Route 9 and, and, and goes down So anywhere seven. along Route 9, <coughs> so we don't have to go to like Amherst Middle School no, or whatever. No, no, so. I'm not going to okay. Amherst Middle School. Okay. Okay. There's an impact study. There's sur survey and permitting costs. Um, this is another unknown at this point, so we put a very large placeholder in here because you don't know 
the grid has to be able to accept the energy that you produce, so that you're not overloading the grid. Or, and so you have to do a study. The utility, uh, Eversource has to do a study to try to determine what they're going to need. Where's the nearest substation? Can the substation accommodate the amount of electricity? If not, what's it going to take to make that happen? Um, so we put a large placeholder in there. You don't know this figure until you actually submit a plan to the utility and then they take a couple months and they turn around and say, we have this substation here, you've got a green light or you've got a yellow light and it's going to cost you this amount of money or you've got a red light, you're going to have to pay a lot of money. So we put in a lot of money here. We put in three quarters of a million dollars to upgrade the grid should the utility require us to do that. So the total cost now is um, four four point eight million dollars um, and now we're going to go to Michael can you make use your make the whole screen larger yeah absolutely thank you but even beyond that uh, no my computer is um, was made in 1870 and okay. doesn't do that <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you can go to 100% and just see well I can try yeah uh, try that and yeah, maybe go to like 125 or 150 okay yeah that'll work just gonna but then it, then, it, then it kind of does it cut off stuff oh no that's good that? is that better yeah, okay makes, so um, basically what we've done here is looked at all of the sources of revenue and expenses that the project would have um, one of the big things is that in year one I'm going to go to the the really good news first and that is that we will get a payment from the federal government for 27 percent 28, somewhere between 27 and 28 percent of the project's cost in, a, in, in money from the IRS. It used to be that if you were a town, you couldn't do these kind of projects without bringing in a developer because you pay no taxes and you couldn't get a tax credit. Well, the in Inflation Reduction Act under the Biden administration basically said that if you're a town, you can in fact take advantage of this. And so the IRS will cut you a check for this amount of money. So that comes in after year one. Um, the assumption is that, that the, the entire amount is of $485,000. Million. 4.8 million. Four, four, this isn't going to work here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, is going to be uh, financed with a 3% 20-year loan. Um, and that's because Hadley has a fabulous bond rating, apparently, and we have access to very inexpensive money. So that is also another factor that makes the project look pretty good. So can you talk a little bit about the IRA and getting the money back? Like, how long is that good for? What What's the window that this is open oh, this, for? This, the investment, the, the, the investment tax credit, it's called the ITC, has been around in various forms for at least a decade, maybe 15, at least 15 years. And um, that is a, 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 a centerpiece of the Inflation Reduction Act. And uh, it, it's, it's, it was passed by Congress. It's not going anywhere. Okay. It doesn't have a cap on how much money that they, they're not going to run out of that money. Gotcha. Okay. So that's a good question. Um, so the solar panels are going to put out uh, 1.7 megawatts. The electricity that the, that the town of Hadley is going to save, valued at 12 cents a watt, is going to is save us about $210,000 a year. Then this is the incentives that we were just talking about. There's an incentive to put the solar panel on a landfill, which is a couple pennies. There's an incentive to have it power municipally owned buildings. That's a couple pennies. And there's a base incentive. And all the three of those incentives add up to about eight cents a watt, which doesn't sound like a lot, that is a lot. unless you're do you have a lot of energy being used, which we do, yes. Can you go down to the year 20? Yes, I can. Can you just give me a minute? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so um, basically there are, I just want, I just want to kind of show everybody that what we've included here and, and hopefully somebody can point out something that's not included and we can make it a better proposal. Um, insurance costs are in here. Um, operations and maintenance are in here as a negative uh, 
income because the town's going to have to maintain these. Um, this I is with the town owning the, this. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All this right. is all presupposed the town owns this. Okay. Um, in the past, as I said, you had to have a developer come in and do it because you couldn't take advantage of that tax credit. Right. And the developer also took all the profit right. as well, obviously. Right. So mm -hmm. the town in this case would be in the driver's seat and would be able to reap, reap the rewards. Okay. Um, so you, the maintenance would be mowing costs and, and, and repairing anything should they break. I mean, those of us who have solar know that they're <laughs> They're pretty well built systems, and they 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 don't require a lot of maintenance. But here we have it, nonetheless. Some 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 funds in there. Maybe the town has to buy a different kind of a lawnmower to get around the panels on the dump. I don't know. But there's 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 dollars in here for that. Do you what do they have growing on the dump now? Is it just regular grass? It's just grass. Yeah. 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 So the annual benefits uh, per year, once you take in all the energy saved. You add in those adders for all those incentives that are also coming from the utility company, and then you subtract the insurance and the operating maintenance costs, and you subtract your loan fee, uh, your loan payments. The annual benefits are about 70, you know, awesome. here they are each year, that, of, of what the town would gain, basically, from doing this. Um, in the very first year, you're, you're, you're making a big payment because you're getting your money from the IRS and 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 paying off the regular loan payment plus the the IRS money is coming in and you're going to use that after the first year to pay down a big part of the initial money that you bought that you borrowed to buy, to buy the whole thing um, so let's go down and uh, before we get to the 20th year I just want to show one other thing there's there's another incentive called um, rec income which is right here, and there's no money in that for the first 20 years. But the renew renewable energy certificates, um, for those of us who have solar, does anybody know what an SREC is? Mm -hmm. um, so many people do. It, it, it's <coughs> this is a REC, which is not as valuable. But anytime you have alternative alternative energy, the the utilities will pay. Are they required to have a, a certain number of these recs at the end of the year? So, if you've got them, you can sell them to the utility. And, and the problem is, you can't sell your recs if you're participating in this smart program up here. So, the smart thing to do is to participate in the smart program until that's exhausted. And then, that once that's done, then you pick up the rec payments in, in the later years of the project. So, let's go down to the final. Um, Numbers before we go down there, let's just see where we are. The cumulative savings is this purple column right here, and so we're talking about a, a two million dollar savings for the town over the course of 25 years, which is a fire truck at least. <laughs> Not 25 years, <laughs> no. yeah, but it, no, the, that's true. The that's important true. word is no. savings. No, we but this is a very less. this is a very conservative es estimate of, of what the cost and what the income are. Um, there is a whole slew of battery incentives that I don't understand because they're pretty new to this whole system. And once they once we figure out those battery incentives, we'll put them in here, and um, and the numbers will likely get a little bit better. We also need, when talking about batteries, we also need to think about how we're going to protect them from from flooding should that occur I mean you know, a lot of us have farmland out there that we're concerned about these are lithium batteries probably want to spend some extra money and get them up high so that if the river it ever did get over the the dike and that area flooded the batteries would be up high yes if you order that two million dollars again that we were in the black yes sure Please. hold on just a second So after everything of mowing lawns and maintenance and whatever needs to be done, of course, with the year and inflation, fuel and everything else, yeah. after all those expenses, which is after 20 years, uh, over half a million dollars, it would be, okay, $2 million plus profit out over after 25 years of the use of the Well, family. each year would be a, 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 a profit. These are the profits each year, basically. Right. Okay. And then cumulatively add it up, they equal this. Okay. Looks like it would be more than that. So, so. is there, 
you're 21, that's a huge jump. Do the wrecks do that much for us? Um, that's a good question. A9 to A33. You pay your loan off at that point? That, that's that, what it that's is. Probably yes, it. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot to keep in your brain all at once. <laughs> Who said that? Thanks, Jack. <laughs> so this what's the area of the landfill like how many panels would yeah, this be I um, I I went over to Randy Iser's office this morning and looked at the acreage of the landfill and there's and I should know that um, is it about three acres or no it's considerably more than that okay. it's Closer to seven or eight acres, and you're talking and, about and the whole dome. Of yeah, the dome? Yeah, well, the acreage, the, the the land that the town owns there is is about seven acres, I believe, and the top of the landfill that's not being used by Solid Waste Solutions to to, to be as a transfer station is more than adequate to to do this, which I think we need about four acres to actually. Of, of panels to, to get this. Randy surveyed it and so I mean, well, there's we, a way we to looked find at out it, definitely. Well he's a surveyor. We yeah, didn't yeah. actually survey it but you can look at the uh -huh. acreage and see. Yeah. What about, I can't remember that man's name that Carolyn brought in. but Jonathan he's, Parrott. Yeah, yeah. He said something about that maybe that site is too close to the river or it's too, even though it's a dome according to the Maps. It looks too low. Well, there blah, 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 blah. there is a possibility that um, that you know because that that we would run into a um, issue of being within 200 feet of a, of the waterway. Basically, um, he was concerned about flooding. I, if that were the case, you couldn't put solar panels anywhere in Hadley on the ground because right. it's, it's no higher and lower than the rest of the town. Right. Um, I was a little bit concerned about the pro the closeness to the to the Connecticut River and whether there's you know you're not allowed to build that close to the river, but my sense is that if there's already a dump there, it's already considered okay built on built on property. There. Yeah, you know we would have we might have to finesse that or we might have to contract the size a little bit and put some panels on on the school. So yes, can you go to the year where it says our estimated output is zero, please? And the orange, on the way, all, all the way this down. right here. Yes, if you could please go all the way down. All right, the way down. Right what is that? That is estimated solar output. Point. Yes, you can see it's declining every of year. Oh yeah, everybody yeah. knows they they go down about a percent, a little under a percent a year, and that's been most people's experience as well. Now, has there been when these solar panels are pretty much below their value? Has there been an actual Someone that asked the question, after 25 years, when they've been degraded, what would it cost to replace them or dispose of them to what those costs are? Um, I don't know, but I can look into that. Just because it's yeah. like, okay, we're doing this for 25 years, we're making $2 million, but it's going to cost $3 million for us to dispose of them? Well, you really, you know, just enough, enough and actually a true number, you know, it's great to have them. But how much more money are we going to be spending to dispose of them and putting on another three gig yeah. you know, system right. on there? Yeah, That's they're mostly um, aluminum and glass, which are highly recyclable. So there's not it's not a heavy burden to dispose of them. There are some recycling facilities in place now that there needs to be a lot more capacity because a lot of this stuff's going to be coming down the pike in 20 years. Sure. Um, so, you know, I can get some prices on that, and you're right, we should put Just as a, as a question, yeah, we should, no, it, we sounds, should. it sounds great after 25 yeah, years, yeah. but if it's going to cost a million to dispose of them, you know what yeah. I mean. It's not, a ha it's not a hazardous substance, so... Um, Just a question to yeah, ask. Is what, yeah, no, know, it's a good question, and, and it should be in here, and, and that's an oversight, and we can add that in there. Thank you. Yeah. So after 25 years, we'd be looking at kind of starting this whole process over again with new panel? Well, you could. Um, who knows? I mean, uh, Joe told me they were going to have electricity out of wa tap water. 
you know. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty the technology so, will be, be so different. There may be something better. Twenty-five better years down, from now, down, so down the road, who knows? Um, be a lot uh, less expensive, probably. Yeah. So yeah. yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. No. I'm, I'm really concerned about the lifting of batteries. Yep. When they go, you know, because we don't know how long exactly they're going to last, and that's the that's the key that everybody's yep. worried about. Yep. Yeah, that, so that's a really very good expensive fire. to get rid of yep. lithium. Very that's a, dangerous. That's a really good point. Um, what this has in the budget here is. Um, uh, part there we go. So there is a. Three hundred thousand dollars for um, uh, battery replacement in year eighteen, and ninety thousand dollars for inverter replacements in year twenty. So that's that's included in here. And we, so we get pretty solid estimates on what the, the what it's going to cost us to dispose of the lithium. Yes. Thank you. So can you walk us through the process? How did you come up with all these numbers? Well, I talked to two, um, I, I used to, well, I still run a company called Rural Aggregators New England, and that has nothing to do with this. I, I've just, but it is in the solar field, and I do know a number of people who are, who do this for a living, and they were kind enough to help me put together the, the basis and, and the spreadsheet. Um, uh, one is, um, yeah, uh, one's name. I, I, I probably shouldn't say who yeah. they are, but they're, they're, they're experienced. They do large systems and they, yeah, they set. The, they're good at setting all this up. Yes, they know. Yes, it, one of one of them. Um, I mean, I can't remember the name of his company, but Haskell Whirlin, I mean, he, he's been in this business longer than anybody, and he provided some of the basis for it. And the other um, is Isaac Baker, and he uh, runs a company in Boston that, that does this as well. So. It was amazing, a real revelation. After 20 years, our shingles had gone bad, um, and we had to replace our solar panels and the new panels are actually generating three times the amount of the ones we put on 20 years ago. Just incredible with the gains in 20 years. I wonder what yeah. it would be like yep. in 20 years yep. in the future. Mm -hmm. yep. oh, and they're already talking about solar in the shingles and who knows what it will well, be that, like. Yeah, they, have, they already have that technology, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean. Are there any other so questions different? about from folks, is it reasonably clear? Um, Michael, thank you for putting yeah, this here. Yeah, you just said that you had your shears taken off. How much did it cost you to get rid of them? Um, gave them to somebody who could use them. Really? Really, mm -hmm. because they had 10 years left. But it didn't make sense for us to put them back on and only right. get 10 more years of life. Well. What help do you need from the committee at this point? Well, um, the, the biggest unknown here is on the inputs page, and it's really what the, um, what it's going to cost to make the grid accept this energy. Mm -hmm. And the only people who know that are the engineers who work at Eversource. And there's not a lot of transparency about how they come up with it or when they tell you it's going to cost $300,000, there's not a lot of transparency about why it's going to cost that. But they're the ones who decide that. So what you need to do is submit what's called a single line drawing, which is a rough sketch of, of the system to them. And then they will, and you tell them how many you know, how big, how, how much of a load you're going to be introducing into the grid. And then they'll tell you whether the substation, where the substation is that it's going to impact and, and how that substation needs to be upgraded or, or not. Um, and that costs, in order to get that study done, it would be under $10,000, but the, the, the town would have to shell that out in order to make the next step to try to see whether this, you know, it, how much that's going to cost. So it, it's, um, 
it looks like a tiny bit of money compared to these dollars, um, especially compared to the amount of money that, that it could earn, but it is money and the, the town would have to put to risk that uh, somewhere under $10,000 to get that study done. Do we know if there are grants that can be applied to that? Uh, th there might be. Uh, um, I, you know, I, I, there, there may be. Yeah. A, it they probably like are. MVP. They would probably take time. It would probably cost us more than ten thousand dollars in in lost revenue to, <laughs> to to make that happen. But yeah, go ahead. If the land that's down by uh, where the dump is, when it came to the sizing of the grid, are you just trying to use as much land that you have to get the most output? Is that what it was, or was this something guesstimated by of all the municipal buildings that we have, guesstimating of what our our, our uh, output is our use of our electric bill, or are we going to say, okay, we want to max out what we have on this town on land and get as much as we can and store it and do it that way? Yeah, um, they, the second answer to your question is that basically we took the amount of energy that the town uses, and that is generally how it's done is you look at what your what your needs are and you build your system to fit. The town has a lot, a very large need, and so we can draw do a very large panel. You might want to make it a little bit bigger because maybe, you know, the, 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 the Hopkins Academy is going to have a geothermal heat and that's going to use some more electricity. There's going to be electrification going on, so you might want to pad it a little bit. The numbers that, that I used for this were a combination of 2021 for some of the buildings and 2022 for other buildings so somebody will need to do a better job of really getting those numbers and maybe padding them a little bit with a, with an explanations and bumping the size up I, I don't you know but and all of that actually does pretty much cover that seven acres no it doesn't oh, okay no no there's more room okay yeah, there's more Thank you. so it does so you're saying we wouldn't necessarily want to use as much of the land as we could I, 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 you know, I haven't, nobody's laid it out yet, okay. so I'm just speculating, okay. but based on the fact that you can generally put, um, I, I don't remember the numbers and I'm going to dig through it, and find okay. it but, but there's a, there's a certain number of megawatts per acre that you can do. And, and our sense was that there's, there's plenty of land there to do it on. Right. No, but I was thinking about what Jonathan Perot said, or Perot, whatever, was that, the bigger the better otherwise it's not worth your cost of hooking right it up and we and were under a, a very false impression about what this town's load was at that time and we were talking in terms of a half a megawatt system now since that time we've actually added up the town's usage it's, it's considerably bigger and it's that. a bigger system okay. and so it kind of makes this you know the, it makes some of these costs somewhat incidental because it's such a bigger system. So right. some of these one-time costs, like running the three-phase, gets diluted over a much bigger Because project. we would benefit yeah. so much yeah. by yeah. doing that. Yeah. Okay. Michael, can you email this to me? Because I'm going to need to yeah. include it. Yeah. Actually, can we all have a copy? Yeah, I can get a yeah. copy. I'd, I'd like to... update so we can Yeah, it's going to update. It's, it's, you know, it's not... Because um, this is too much for me to hold. <laughs> yeah, it, it's complicated, and it and, and it's going to change as, as we get into it. But what we've done here is done a very, very conservative estimate. Right. Um, increasing our costs with lots of contingencies and, and, and underplaying the, the income, not even counting the battery adders that we would get. So it, it's we, well, we try to be as conservative as we can, and, and as we get better at looking at what what the next steps would be, and if the town just were to decide to go ahead and do this, um, then then, <laughs> then we then the picture will become clearer as we go. So right. is the next step to take this to like the select board? Is that I think the next there? step would be to get get a hire somebody to do a single line drawing, okay. um, and and uh, okay. and then submit that to EverSource and see what those numbers are. So in order to do that, would we have to submit this to the select board absolutely. so they could? Yeah, absolutely. Jane, can can you tell us is that is that a select board decision? Is it a town yeah, meeting? Yeah. And the, so does it, does the town need to vote on it as a whole, or is it small enough so that it doesn't? So we would need to get on a select board agenda, and <coughs> I think what we need to do is to not push specifically for this, but to look at what the whole town is doing and see where this fits in in terms of energy. Hmm. Um. And I don't have the answer to what we're, the town is 
doing, but I know there are more options than just the landfill for solar. So Besides the library and the senior center? It isn't just solar that the land, I mean, and then we have the heat pumps. Hmm. Right, but they don't generate electricity. They don't generate electricity, but it's the whole use of energy in the town that's being looked at as a big picture, not individual. And part of it is if, you know, we're buying, let's say, the building inspector, an electric car, then we need the electric car station, which luckily is financed now by the state. But they're just a variety of things that are all still being put together. and I. I think if we come in with this too early, that it will be said. So I just wait. Should we part give of it a comprehensive moment. plan? I think it's it's happened. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess we do need like a climate action plan. Yeah, I don't think this precludes any other installations. Any other other installations that we're talking about are microscopic compared to this. Yes. Well, because this is the other side of it. This is generating electricity. Those, all those other things are energy reduction action, you know, putting in better, more efficient heat, and, you know, heat I mean, pumps in the what, geothermal. What I would suggest, and I mean, obviously we would want to discuss this as a climate committee, but that, that we designate part of, it, part of this revenue, maybe half of it goes right into general funds and a portion of it goes toward the town being able to replace as things wear out its inefficient pumps at the sewage treatment plant with much more efficient pumps and and this could be part of that overall strategy so that we had a fund to kind of make these other energy reducing decisions so the profit as, as, would go into oh, energy as we efficient. go on it yeah. seems like that would be a a really shrewd way of, hmm. of using the money and, and continuing this and magnifying the savings. Would we want to consider inviting Carolyn to one of our meetings and put this in front of her? Yes, I think she should. I mean, when What's you that? get your other inviting information, Carolyn? like the questions that Peter was asking about disposal, etc., I think when we have a clear picture. Mm -hmm. the, well, maybe. We'll be in a better place. Okay. Do you feel more comfortable? It just seems like this would be so useful in in the select board looking at all these usages of electricity and how we're going to reduce that, knowing that we could do this also, like icing on the cake. I just don't want to be premature. Right. Do you think if we think about February, Having a couple of months to get those answers. Sure. And then. Sure. All right. You ready for the lights to be back on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's too expensive, though, Jane. Hold on. I know. I know. But don't want Let's build a campfire. <laughs> uh, thank you for pulling together. All those numbers. Yeah, that was really great, Michael. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Michael, good job. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I enjoy doing it. So. Oh, good. Right. So here, if you want to pull up to the table, Marion, okay. let's circle back to the speaker series real fast. We talked about having the farm conversation. What other ideas come to mind that all of you have? I still like the idea of Stephen Roof coming and doing that climate change. Um, presentation oh no what was it? it wasn't climate change it was unpacking the state's plan and um, which would what Stephen Roof. Stephen Roof teaches um, environmental stuff I don't know what all at Hampshire College okay. and Jack and I heard him speak at yeah. the Hitchcock Center like a month ago and he did this really good presentation that explains the plan the state, uh, the state's response to all this climate change information, which is a lot of people think the state's trying to force us to do things, but it's actually opposite. They're taking responsibility for, oh, here's what's going on. What do we need to do? And um, and he does it has a really nice PowerPoint that just does a really good job of explaining. And now, I mean, 
it's in the news constantly now and like mm -hmm. every day in the newspaper just about there's some especially with the big meeting where is it in dubai and you know we're getting new information about it's taking less heat to do more melting of the arctic and uh the time is now not in 10 years it's like now we we absolutely need to stop burning so much fossil fuels so um he just does a really good job of explaining what's going on but also the state's way of responding to it which again is not forcing anybody to do anything but actually here's how we'll help like like that green communities yeah. you know there's all this grant money the state is literally giving us the money to make these energy reduction changes in our municipal buildings so they're not forcing it they're just saying we need to so here we'll help you and and I think Governor Healy is being very responsive to, to realize that a lot of people can't afford to put a solar on their home unless there's this huge incentive to do it. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to put together better grant money and stuff so that people can do these things. And, you know, we can put in charging stations for cars without it breaking the town. And I don't know. Anyway, so that so just seems like a, a good information for people. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. So you want to have him here. Yeah, do you want to follow up for maybe the springtime and see yeah. his availability? Well, I mean, so I wouldn't invite him to come to our meeting. Right. This would be like a uh, it could be a session at the library. Right, like the one we went right. to the geologist did. So it wouldn't it could be in in January or February, whenever he can do it and there's a slot open at the library because yep. it would be a public forum yep. kind of situation where right. do you feel comfortable taking that on? Yeah, sure. Right. Sounds good. So we have two ideas that we're moving forward with the farm conversation and Stephen Ruth and sort of laying out the state's plan for um, decarbonization. All right. That was what it was called. I couldn't think of that. Yeah. So specialized stretch code? So the update on that is I've been in touch with Chris Mason. You know, I said I would find somebody more knowledgeable than me that could come and really explain this to us and answer all of our questions. So I've been in touch with Chris Mason. He didn't feel comfortable. He feels like he's not quite knowledgeable enough. Anyway, he has found us an energy code specialist. They're going to come together to our next meeting um, and using this power, really excellent PowerPoint that I saw at that Bedford Community Forum. Um, it's just really good. Anyway, so an expert is going to come and uh, show us this PowerPoint and talk to us and answer our questions all about everything we need to know about the specialized code. All right. And this will happen in the January meeting? Yep, January. Okay. Okay. So that's January? Yeah. And I... Can we, can I just clarify? Yeah. Um, cause I, I know there are people that, that are concerned about this, that the entire stretch code is only if you happen to be rebuilding new construction or replacing something that's broken. It does not require anybody to install anything. Well, Any wait, wait, wait. There's the stretch code that we have right now. Right. And that's on new buildings, renovations, uh, uh, you know, a uh, bunch of stuff. This opt-in specialized stretch code is a step above that. It applies to new construction only, not renovations. Or right. So it doesn't require anybody to rip out their wood stove. It doesn't require anybody to rip out their oil burner. It has nothing to do with any of that, right? The stretch code, no, the, opt the specialized stretch code would not okay. do that. The, the code, the plain stretch code that we have now doesn't do that. I just want to be clear on that. And it yeah. doesn't say anything about campfires, right? No. Okay. <laughs> no. No. As a matter of fact, one thing that Chris Mason did clear up for me, and they'll talk about this, you know, next month, is that the super efficient pellet stoves that basically what burn 
what, 98% of it. Yeah, like they're super efficient and they put out very little pollution. Um, they're allowed. Um, it, I mean, it falls under that uh, mixed use. Okay. But when you say allowed, use. you don't mean that wood stoves are disallowed or not allowed. You mean that they are el eligible for incentives. Anything, yeah. Okay. Well, no, that isn't what I said. You know what? It's, I, let's not get into yeah, this now well, I, because I think it's I'm good not, because I think there's a lot of concern. No, there is. That's why I'm bringing in an expert and let him okay. answer these questions. Okay, these are all questions yeah, that we can Nobody, yeah. I can honestly say that no one will ever knock on anyone's door and tell you how to heat, heat your home. That's never going I to happen. I think that's coming. I really no, that will never happen. How long Kathy, is it going to be before Kathy, the cows are shipped yeah. out of oh, Adam? Okay. <laughs> all right, anyway. No. We're not engaged. I'm not kidding. This is, this is serious Kathy, stuff. Kathy, okay, all right. Okay. It's, it's not funny. I'm not it's not it's gonna it's gonna true. Deal it's, with that. I don't think it's Can funny. you call up the email that I sent you? And I know you had something on MMA. Oh, right. So I attended the webinar on uh, how to run a good <laughs> committee <laughs> meeting. <laughs> and... Um, it was very good. The panel consisted of all previous and present select board members. And um, they pretty much said the same advice that we'd already received. The additional parts were, let me think about it for a minute. Lost my train of thought. Um, oh, follow the same format every, every meeting, like just stick with this order of how we run our meetings that it's then people know is anybody even listening to me? okay um know what to expect um then a couple other things that made me feel really good because we don't we don't do these bad things but they cautioned against committee members or select board members deliberating outside of a meeting on topics which is an open meeting law violation, and we don't ever do that. Um, and they also said something about for uh, chairpersons of committees and boards to, <laughs> I thought this was really interesting, to remember you are not king or queen of the committee. In other words, it's not your committee, that you are, your role is as a facilitator to you know, run the meeting and that, you know, you have some say over how things happen, but it's not like up to us to decide totally just between us what's going to be on the agenda. Sure. That you should always, you know, look to input from members, which we do. Mm -hmm. So I was, I just thought it was interesting the way they said that, you're not king or queen of the, anyway, so that was basically it. So I think we're doing pretty well. and. Right. You know, Thanks. it's interesting. Any new topics coming from members of the committee? Because I have two items that weren't anticipated at the time of posting this agenda the other day. So one comes in from Patrick Bereza, who is the library director in town. And if you can call up that email. So the question came up a while ago about the library. Um, and if you can scroll down a little bit. Oh, the so, but Patrick, no, for library use and oh. circulation. Yep, if you scroll down a little bit. So Patrick compiled his numbers from 2019, the old Goodwin Library, to the new Hadley Public Library. And he compared <coughs> them. And so these, this is patron visits by month. I'm not exactly sure how they track them. They do. And you can see in 2019 what the numbers were like, and in 2023 with the new library, mm -hmm. you can see the numbers significantly increase. And what he found is from the old library to the new library, that it was a 71% increase in total annual usage. Mm -hmm. So it didn't quite double, but Pretty almost. Because the, the point got raised a few meetings ago, white elephant, all of this, can you show us the numbers? What changed before and after, and Patrick actually did a pretty commendable job in pulling this all together. So the new library, you know, if this is one measure of success, it certainly seems that the library is pretty successful. It's almost doubled. Okay, but we're the climate committee. No, I know.
but it, it came up. And then for total circulation activity, if you go here, it just this question was posed okay. to us. Yeah, yeah. And um, an answer hadn't gone to him. I was hoping he would be here tonight. He is not. For items loan, 33% increase in circulation of physical materials, so also going up. So now, when it comes to energy use, it's hard to compare a duck and a goose, and that's what you would be doing here, the old Goodwin, to the new Hadley Public Library. I don't know how you can compare them, and that was the question it's that came up, but um, it's really pretty successful. Mm -hmm. The second item that came up is from Mara Shulman. She was one of our guests about, I don't know, four months ago, five months ago. She's a lawyer in Northampton, and she's doing some work with the state legislature and Plastic Free Massachusetts. She is wondering if the Hadley Climate Change Committee could include some of the data. Every year, for the last three years, we've been doing a spring cleanup day. And she's wondering if we feel comfortable sharing some of the pictures and sharing some of the data from people who reported back on those spring cleanup days with what she's sharing with the state. What is she again now? So she was a lawyer who came in a few months ago. Mara. And she is a lobbyist as well. And she is working on a plastic free Massachusetts and every year because she knows we do a spring cleanup day. Okay. She's wondering if they can share some of their data when she testifies in Boston. Okay. So wanted to put that out for discussion on what people think. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Do we have data? Well, we have lots of pictures. We have lots of data now. People weren't using the same bags. Some people use small white bags. Some people use bigger bags. But we have... So it wasn't weighed or anything? It was estimated. So at least... You know, Claire and I, we got 11 bags. So we know that for the total. But everybody put in numbers. Um, of how many bags? Yes. And you guys are working in the rain, too, right? Last year we worked in the rain. That makes the bags heavier. <laughs> yeah, it does. Are, those, uh, are these plastic bags or are they the big bags you get at Home Depot, you know, the paper ones? No, we did not use paper bags. So we used the larger bags. They were all donated by Home Depot. So we used their bigger bags. We also had the smaller sort of kitchen size, I guess Garbage you would call bags. them, with yeah. a tie on top. What, what, kind of, what was the material? That's a, I'm asking if it was a paper or a plastic or... It was like the black construction, plastic construction and bags. Right? Yeah. yeah, plastic. plastic. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What, what is it that she wants to use this information? So she wants to use it as part of her... Push for getting rid of plastic. Let's see. <laughs> she is testifying before the state saying um, there are lots of towns in Massachusetts that are dealing with trash problems. Some of the towns, like Hadley and some others, are picking them up and look at what they're finding. Okay. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there's still plenty of trash all around. And some towns have passed ordinances where the liquor stores in town can't sell nips. Mm. Mm. Just to be clear, yeah. what yeah. she's interested in is right. passing, <coughs> increasing the beverage deposit legislation. So. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to need a motion and then we'll vote. Okay. I, make, I move that we share this information with her. Pictures. Right, a second. Okay. And a vote. Everybody in favor. All right. <laughs> Good. Jack, can I ask you a question about the white elephant? Yeah. Because that's the only building in the town that has all and only heat pumps, right? From what I know, because I don't think the senior center there on propane. Would we be able to find out, with especially with the doubling of the capacity? from last year to, to this year, whatever, for the library. And since that's the only building that we know that has the heat pumps, is there any way of finding out how the electric bill is for that building? So, Jane, just as a want, curiosity. you want to take that on just because I have nothing to do with the bills, nothing to do with no, the No, I'm just no, curious so, to, to help me with those incentives of the geothermal for uh, potentially for the high school to saying, how is this, you know, is this really working well for us and how's our electric bill and especially can with it, working can with it for our grid for the dump, 
you know, just kind well, of yeah. nice to know. One thing to, to think about once once Jane gets you those numbers is that I, I, it's not a ground source heat, heat bump over here. It's it's right. there are many. No, I know, but we're talking. Okay, we're talking about the high school. And that the high school is ground source, and that's there. and and that tends to be three times as efficient as right. an no, air. Okay. Well, and also okay. the other thing to remember is that the way it was supposed to work at the library was put in heat pumps and put solar on the roof to generate the electricity. Right, to compensate for the to usage. Right. Right, so the elect, you know, they do use electricity, but the library should be generating its own. I agree. So, yeah. we need to fix. Well, and anyway, just nice yeah, to know is how yeah, maybe how some well and efficient that building is, because well, like everybody says, it's the white elephant with having thirty foot high ceilings and there's only one well, of books. Okay, so just <laughs> everybody saying it's a white elephant. I've heard one person use that phrase in this meeting. Oh, there, 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 there are other people. But it would be nice okay. to know how efficient right. uh, those heat pumps well, are. Well, like Kathy yeah. says, part of their efficiency was the production of the energy that was going to run them, and that hasn't happened yet. Well, and also it's apples to oranges. What The real comparison needs to be how efficient are the heat pumps compared to a fossil fuel burning furnace no, situation. I, 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 I mean... Agree. And I think, hands down, it's the cost of electricity for the heat pumps is less than we'd be spending on fuel oil for... Yep. But so, yeah, so, so Jane will get that information. So Jane, thanks, thanks for getting that information. Yeah. And then if we yeah, ever yeah. get the yeah. solar on the roof, All right. then mm -hmm. we're really... Fix the roof first. Yes. All right, so... The brand new roof. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, and that is everything that I had for items not anticipated at the time of posting this agenda. Okay, Early this week. Yeah. Can we call it call What's that? to an ordinal? Can I just say one thing mm -hmm. before we end? Does, does Hallie have like an adopt the highway? I don't like know. Other towns not do not that I've have, ever like, seen. They have the snowmobile club will maintain, and it goes on the side of the road, it says adopt the yes. highway, and then you're responsible for maintaining mm -hmm. that section of the road, and then somebody else, like okay. the, the okay. Girl Scouts would have the one on the side of the road. The, that the only adopt, adopt the highway, highway program I know is um, your competitor. And that's Merv, and he goes out and he clears Route 47 of all the junk on the side. <laughs> that's the only adopt I highway. No, well, I'm just saying. Jane? I, I, yeah, I have to select for it. I see Randy out there every spring, and his wife with bags of trash. I'm like, hey, what about adopt the highway? The Girl Scouts could do it, or the Boy Scouts, or other groups in town. You know? So one comment on that. The... The seventh grade has been painting signs over the last few years. Those actually look good. I like those. Thank you. So we've been working together with them to get that done, and we've been putting them up around town in certain trash-filled places to try to help limit the trash that we're picking up in the springtime. And we hope that the um, trash uh, pickup can continue next spring. We'll yeah, see if we get for year number four. For those so. that love to go out. And All right. Jane? What do you think? Any adopt a highway program? Anything I like that? I will look it up and see what I can find. All right. All right. Thank you. And. How about if people just keep their trash in every place? How about? I don't think so either, Jane. So oh, really? Okay. I really don't mm -hmm. think. I, I still think so we need ordinance. Let's see. Let's adjourn. Yeah. 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 Yeah.